Welcome to the Great Loop Radio Podcast, brought to you by America's Great Loop Cruisers Association. We're dedicated to sharing Great Loop information and inspiration with those actively cruising, planning for, or dreaming about a Great Loop adventure. I'm Kim Russo. I'm the director of AGLCA. Today we are going to talk Florida, and a lot of loopers are along the Gulf Coast heading from Alabama into Florida. In our November issue of the Great Loop Link e-magazine, we did cover some of the things you should know before cruising Florida, but we thought this would be a great opportunity to bring this a little bit more to the masses, so to speak. So Karen Nettles from the Homeport crew will be joining me today to walk through some of this. Before we jump in, I do want to take a moment, as I always do, to recognize and thank our Admiral sponsors who support AGLCA at the highest level. They are Curtis Stokes & Associates, Great Loop Yacht Sales, Passage Maker Trawler Fest, and Skipper Bob Publications, um, and Water Right Guide Media. As always, we encourage the, all of our listeners and viewers to support these businesses that support the Great Loop. So uh, I'd like to reintroduce everyone to Karen Nettles from the Home Port Crew. Karen, thanks for joining me. Oh, you're quite welcome. Always like to do the podcast with you. Yeah, today might be a little bit of a unique one because uh, we are currently docked in um, Port St. Joe, Florida. We are going to be doing the Gulf Crossing tonight. Um, <laughs> we are meeting our buddy boats out at Dog Island, and in order to intersect with them on their path, it turns out right as we're recording is about the time we are supposed to be leaving the dock. <laughs> so Michael is <laughs> getting all the lines off the boat. You may hear engine noise in the background as we continue uh, if we're ready to go and he starts those up. So we're going to bring this to you anyway. If you're hearing this, it means that nothing went, uh, you know, too horribly wrong in, in hearing the audio for this. But um, so anyway, uh, this might also be, you know, kind of a master class in what it's like to work aboard. <laughs> because <laughs> Literally, yeah. It, literally, the rest of the world's schedule does not o always intersect well with ours. But we're going to go forward and just kind of see how it goes. So where should we jump in, Karen? Um, yeah, you said mentioned that the article in the newsletter about Florida and, and this time of year, we do get a lot of members that put questions in the forum and so forth. So uh, what are some things that loopers should need to know specifically? Where can we go on the website on the greatloop.org website to find the resources to begin with? Yeah, so absolutely. The first place to look is our website. And if you're a member of AGLCA, there are tons of resources and some for non-members. Um, but the forum is a great place that is for members only, but you can search the archive there for some of these repetitive topics that we'll talk about today. Um, but overall, the segments area of our website, if you go to the, uh, the Great Loop route menu, there's a segments option there. And we actually built that out. Initially, the main purpose was to share some of this perennial information where the same questions come up year after year. So that segments area breaks the Great Loop out into about 10 segments. And for each segment, there's kind of an overview of what it's like to cruise that area. And that page also has um, specific skills or considerations that you should keep in mind as you prepare for that area. So we re really encourage you to visit the main page for a segment you're about to tackle for a lot of these details. And, and you'll find most of this content that we're talking about today is in that area. Okay, well, that's good to know. And one of the first things we need to know about cruising Florida is people ask a lot about marina reservations and how far advanced they should be made. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a big question. We get asked that quite frequently. And especially since Hurricane Ian devastated Fort Myers, Florida last year, which was a looper favorite area. Um, many marinas that were there and were staples of the looper community are not there anymore. So that has really made dockage even more scarce than it already was. Um, the good news is there tends to be room for transients. So if you are just looking to you know, continue on in a true transient manner where you're moving every few days or every week, or maybe even two weeks, you shouldn't have too much trouble finding marina space. The place where you have to book and get on waiting lists a year or more in advance is if you want to spend the entire winter, so two or three or four months, in one place without doing a lot of moving. That's where the, the slips are pretty full. Um, you know, you're competing with locals who keep their boat in the water year round, and you're competing not just with loopers, but with snowbirds who move back and forth on their boats. So that's where the true shortage is. So if you are hoping to do the Great Loop and winter in Florida, you know, whether it's the Keys, whether it's the West Coast, even the East Coast now, most marinas have a waiting list for that seasonal dockage, and you usually have to reach out about a year in advance for those. So don't worry about it if you're already on the loop and haven't done that. Continue as a transient, and you should be able to find some spaces. And of course, there are always anchorages as well. well that's good to know. Um, and it 
next topic is the sojourner's permit or temporary registration that some voters need that they need when they enter Florida. So can you tell us about what that is and how somebody goes about getting one? So the sojourner's permit is one of those topics that comes up every year in our forum. And that's why we bring you some resources to figure it all out uh, because it is kind of a confusing topic and it is specific to Florida. It's the only state that I know of that loopers really need to worry about something like this. A sojourner's permit is also called a temporary registration for your boat in Florida. If your boat is registered in Florida, you don't have to worry about this. It does not apply to you. Um, if your boat is registered in a state other than Florida, you do have to have this temporary registration in Florida if you plan to stay in Florida waters for more than 90 days. And you have the first 90 days to apply for this. Um, but so if you're state registered elsewhere, you do need a sojourner's permit. And then the third category is if your boat is not state registered anywhere. So perhaps it's just Coast Guard documented and you don't have a state registration. In that case, you need you still need the permit if you plan to stay for more than 90 days, but you are supposed to apply for it the day you enter Florida. So a little bit trickier for somebody who is not state registered elsewhere. Uh, so whether you're doing that on the day you enter Florida or you're doing it within the first 90 days, it is uh, basically done through the Motor Vehicles Department, and you can do it at a county office. There is a particular form you need to fill out and a particular fee you have to pay. All of the details about this are on our website. You can either so search for Sojourner's Permits, or if you go to the Segments area and go to either the Florida East Coast segment or the Gulf Coast segment, you'll see links to all of the paperwork you need and all of the details on the fees, which counties charge a little less, um, which counties uh, make it a little bit easier because there are some counties that don't do a whole lot of these and therefore it can be a little bit challenging to find somebody who knows how to process this for you. We get asked a lot, well, do I really have to do this? Does anybody really care if I have this? I'm telling you what the regulation is. Each vote is going to have to proceed as they deem fit. We, of course, are encourage you to follow all local regulations, and this is one of them. So if you're not Florida registered and plan to stay for more than 90 days, which is most loopers, uh, you do need to go ahead and get this registration. Okay, good to know the information's there. And moving on, the next thing is the, the Gulf cross, Crossing, which is a big topic, which you already alluded to, that you're getting ready for yours tonight, and it's certainly a milestone for, for loopers, but we do know it causes a good bit of angst. So how can loopers overcome that to get prepared for that and look at it a little bit <laughs> in, in a lighter way? Yeah, and it is the biggest offshore crossing that you will do on the Great Loop. The Great Lakes are, of course, big crossings, and there are some times on the East Coast you may choose to go offshore. Um, the Gulf Crossing, there's two different ways to do it. One is to take the Big Bend route, which is a fairly long jump to uh, from Carabelle, for example, to Steenhatchee, and then a couple more jumps to till you work your way around that Big Bend. That will allow you to typically not have an overnight crossing. Um, it also requires several days of good weather, where if you just go straight across from Apalachicola or, or uh, Carabelle straight to Clearwater Tarpon Springs, you really only need one good weather window. So there's no right or wrong answer here. Our boat can travel fast enough to do the straight across uh, from Carabelle to Clearwater in daylight, which has been our plan all along. The perch herself, um, with Michael at the helm, has done the crossing twice before in daylight hours, and that was our preferred method with me aboard. Um, however, the weather has not been super cooperative. So for the best weather conditions, we are doing an overnight crossing. So it'll be a first for <laughs> me, Michael, and the perch. Um, we have two buddy boats that we have just departed our slips so we can go intersect with them. Um, we will be staging at Dog Island. Um, by the time you see this tomorrow, when we release this podcast, I hopefully will be sound asleep somewhere in clear water. <laughs> Um, but it will be an overnight crossing for us. Um, the way to do an overnight crossing safely is to, uh, we're gonna stage at Dog Island, uh, which means we're kind of a little bit off the shore already. So we're not trying to navigate a narrow passage. Um, we will probably for our speed, leave about eight or 9 p.m. this evening. Many loopers are leaving earlier in the day because their speeds are slower. You're out in the Gulf during the darkest of night where there really is not a whole lot of navigation that you have to worry about. You're just setting a course and following it. And then you want to arrive close to the coastline on the uh, the, the peninsula of Florida, on the west coast of the peninsula uh, after daylight 
because there are tons of crab pots and you certainly don't want to run through a crab pot field, end up with one of those lines wrapped around your prop and not be able to effectively continue to move your boat to get the rest of the way into clear water. So we've timed our speed and um, our plan is currently to leave between eight and 9 p.m. Um, by daylight, we should be about 50 miles offshore and be able to see crab pots and pick up speed a little bit. Um, and ideally arrive in clear water, I think we're thinking about 9 p.m. So about a 12 hour run for us. Um, I talked to a looper last night who's a gold looper and they were coming, they were planning to go from Port St. Joe here, which is a little bit west of Caravel, and go all the way down to Longboat Key, which is south of Tampa. And on their boat, that's a 30 hour run. So like I said, they're gold loopers. They've done this several times before. Um, there's many ways uh, to tackle this. Um, for those who don't want long runs at night, the Big Bend, Heading for Steen Hatchie from uh, Caravelle is a great option for those who can motor a little bit faster um, or who don't want to wait for, th you know, three or so consecutive weather windows to straight across as the method. And that's the one we're picking. So I'll fill you all in on how that goes. Um, but this is also the first time um, we left Panama City Beach yesterday. And if you have followed the podcast, that's kind of where we stopped our loop for a whole number of reasons um, about a year ago, one of which was our, our winter slip reservation and, and uh, Fort Myers no longer existed because the marina was devastated. Um, so this is new ground. Um, and once we get across to the west side of the coastline there on the peninsula, um, we'll be heading south, spending the winter in Punta Gorda, but at some point making the short run from Punta Gorda to Fort Myers so I can finally cross my wake and finish my great loop. So it's, it's exciting stuff for me. Yeah, so we'll definitely look forward to see how your crossing goes tonight. So we'll look yeah, forward to hearing that. <laughs> I should mention I get really seasick. Um, the conditions are supposed to be good, but even good conditions offshore are not usually my friends. So I've already started with uh, some seasick medication. <laughs> um, hopefully I'm still making sense and I'm not going to fall asleep in the middle of the podcast, but I'm um, doing all we can to make sure it's an easy, safe crossing and a comfortable one for me. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, moving on as you cruise on down the Florida, when you get to the Everglades, there's something that you need to get as a boater education course. So you, can you tell us about the certification for that? Yeah, and this is also a, you know, a little known thing and, and maybe not something that is enforced uh, hugely actively, but to correctly um, boat in the Everglades, you do need a special boater education course that you take online. Um, it's, a, it's an easy course. You read the content, you take a test. Um, I do not know of anybody who has ever been asked to show proof of having taken that. But again, you know, we encourage everyone to follow the local regulations. Um, and you may not think you're going through the Everglades, but if you plan to head south, you know, for example, from Fort Myers Beach towards the Keys, and you want to stop into Everglades City or pick an anchorage along the coastline, you are in the Everglades. And a good portion of the inside route between the islands of the Keys is part of um, the Everglades as well. Um, so it's a short, less than an hour. It's going to take you to do it online. You can Google for the Everglades Boater Education Course, or there are links directly on our site, again, in that segments area for the Florida segments of the Great Loop. Okay. Um, and another perennial topic is that only applies in Florida that's worth mentioning on the ICW is a courteous passing. It's courteous passing. <laughs> so can you tell us what that, what boaters need to know uh, about that? Yeah, this is, this is, a, another perennial issue. Um, comes up frequently on our social media. It came up in our members only discussion forum on our website this week. Um, and courteous passing is important. It goes hand in hand with um, honoring no wake zones. Um, I think most of us know what to do in a posted no wake zone. Florida does have a few different kinds of no wake zones. Some are idle speed, no wake, which literally means that drop down to idle speed. Some are minimum speed, no wake, um, or slow speed, minimum wake, sorry about that, which is a little bit different and a little bit nonspecific. Um, and then there's usually a sign that you can resume normal save operations. So be sure you are situa situationally aware as you are cruising that you are obeying those no wake and minimal wake signs. You will see, even see some that are date specific based on wildlife like manatee in Florida. Um, Please be a courteous boater and follow what those signs are telling you. But beyond that, even if something is not posted as a no wake zone, you should be courteous with your wake. And that means slowing down for small boats that are fishing just a little bit outside the channel so you don't swamp them with your wake. It can be very dangerous. Um, slowing down for marinas, always. Uh, slow down if there is a, a boat ramp 
which is usually a posted no wake zone. Um, but be looking for, you know, boats tied up, even if it's at a private dock. Um, I know this gets controversial for some reason. And, you know, that person bought that house and built that dock and put the boat there knowing that they were on a waterway. Um, but when you're flying the AGLCA Virgie, please just be courteous, be cautious of your wake, know what your wake is, is doing to others. Um, and I'll kind of leave it at that, but I do want to talk a little bit about the idea of a slow pass. Um, so courteous passing, you know, I'm including everything that goes on with, with your wake as you're passing other boats, passing docks, et cetera. A slow pass is a specific procedure, though, that we find a lot of our lake boaters um, who are used to cruising in vast open spaces aren't familiar with. And even those who are familiar with the idea of a slow pass don't ne necessarily know how to execute the entire thing. We've done a whole podcast just on this, um, and there is an article linked from the Florida segments area on our website. But essentially, um, to avoid a huge wake, if you are overtaking another boat, you should radio them, uh, let them know that you're going to give them a slow pass, see if they prefer either side of the boat. Um, it's all about communication and working it out with that boat you're about to overtake. You will slow to pass them so that you can uh, not send them a huge wake. But what I think a lot of people actually don't know about the process is the boat being overtaken should also slow um, because then you're allowing the boat that's overtaking you to go slower as well and still pass you. So if you're proceeding at eight knots and there's a 20 knot boat coming up behind you, that 20 knot boat, should they go past you at 20 knots is gonna throw you an enormous weight. Um, they should do a slow pass. If you're already traveling eight, if you slow down to four or five, then they can pass you at six or seven and minimize the wake. Now, every boat design is different. Every boat's kind of got that sweet spot where the wake is smaller. Um, so keep that in mind for your vessel. Figure that out for your vessel. Uh, the same applies when you're meeting another boat, although it's not as important. Um, but a slower boat can still have a substantially hard time dealing with a large wake, even if you're meeting them. Um, so again, if you slow and they slow, you can execute what's what's called a slow pass and everybody can continue on with their day without picking up dishes off the floor and whatever else. And yes, I know you're cruising and you should expect some wakes. And if you haven't secured your dishes, that's partly on you. <laughs> um, I get that. Um, but there are also extreme situations of people passing discourteously and sending up a, an extreme wake that goes beyond what is reasonable to expect and secure your boat for. Um, it happens all the time that we hear it, you know, somebody else flying in the AGLCA Virgie just sent me this huge wake, um, and it's a problem. Um, so I just want to address it here and hope that we can get, you know, get some clarity with people to just please be courteous. And I really think that the biggest problem is not members not caring if they're waking other boats. I think it's just not really understanding the implications of doing so. So hopefully, you know, we can continue to spread the word and, and make some progress on that. Yeah, for sure. Need to be careful out there and keep everybody safe on the waters for sure. Yeah. Let's take a quick break, Karen, and play a message from one of our sponsors. Um, when we come back, we'll just kind of wrap this up with a few more things that you might want to consider before you start to tackle the Florida section of the loop. So we'll be back in a moment. The LAD product line offers stress-free, restful nights while you are away from your boat. LAD is an independent, self-controlled device that continuously monitors your boat's list, position, and more. Your LAD will send you an alert via text and email from anywhere in the world of a potential problem on your vessel. When connected to the boat network, LAD will also monitor bilge pumps, refrigerator, battery voltage, shore power disconnect, intruder alarm, smoke, fire, and more. Set your own alerts, add alert recipients, geofence and track your vessel's position via a secure online map page. LAD never sleeps, so you can. Please visit www.ladalert.com for more information. Life is better by the bay. Here in Panama City, Florida, we have deep blue water surrounded by arts and culture. We love our historic neighborhoods, southern coastal cuisine, and the songs and stories of our locals. And we're sure you will, too. If you're traveling along America's Great Loop, Drop your anchor at St. Andrew's Bay in Panama City and enjoy easy access to waterfront restaurants and shopping, a favorite among loopers. Land or water, you're going to love it here. Visit DestinationPanamaCity.com and learn more. 
We're back on the Great Loop Radio podcast. My guest today is Karen Nettles. She is with the Homeport crew, and we are working through some of the special considerations and skills you might want to have before you start the Florida segment of the Great Loop. Um, Florida has more miles of the Great Loop than any other state. So um, just by default, their loopers spend a lot of time here, but a lot of loopers also slow down in Florida and spend the winter months here. So uh, a lot of people are not as actively moving the boat, which leads to, you know, 90, 120 days, sometimes more than that for loopers spending in Florida waters. So we just want to make sure you know everything you should know about it. So where did we leave off, Karen? Uh, we just finished talking about courtesy passing, and uh, the next topic was daily cruise planning. What should loopers know about doing that on the Florida's intracoastal waterways? What's different yeah. about that? Uh, not a whole lot that's substantially different, but you will not be dealing with too many locks. The Okeechobee Waterway, which cuts through the center, um, you know, cuts from um, Fort Myers over to Stewart, Florida, um, is an option for the Great Loop. So if you're not heading to the Keys, you may go from Fort Myers Beach straight through the Okeechobee to Stewart, Florida. From there, you can head south to Miami, Fort Lauderdale area, or you can jump over to the Bahamas. So that's a popular way to go to. You'll find locks on the Okeechobee. But other than that, you're not dealing with the locks that you had on the inland rivers. The bigger consideration is bridges and which bridges you may need to request openings for. Um, so not a big deal. Uh, some boats may choose to go on the outside for certain runs and pick a safe inlet to hop out and hop back in. Um, but a lot of the bridges, particularly in southeast Florida, are, do not open on request, they instead open on a timed schedule. And that's what you want to look for when you're doing your daily cruise planning, because the last thing you want to do um, is leave a marina and the first bridge that has to open is a mile from you and you haven't checked the schedule. So, uh, you know, maybe it opens on the half and top of the hour and you leave at 9.05 one morning and you're going to be, you know, trying to hold station for a while until that bridge opens. So use your cruising uh, guide, use waterway guide, Waterway guides, icons for bridges flow through to the map on the greatloop.org website, the Great Loop map. Um, and if you tap on those little icons, it tells you what the bridge opening schedule is, you know, whether it's on request or whether there's a schedule. The good news is they time them pretty well. So if there's a series of bridges in a, a fairly short distance, if one opens on the half hour, the next one probably opens at 45 minutes past so that you're not constantly hitting a bridge and waiting. If, if you time your speed with the times that the bridge is open, it's just going to make for a smoother day. So check the bridge times. Make sure you're leaving your anchorage or your marina at a time that's appropriate for the first bridge opening that you're going to need. And then adjust your speed accordingly based on what you've researched for what time the next bridge is open. And like I said, it's not imperative. Um, it's just going to make for a smoother day. If you get stuck at a bridge waiting for a schedule to open, the, opening that's 30 minutes away, it slows you down 30 minutes, but it's also not necessarily fun cruising to be trying to hold station, depending on the weather conditions. If there's a lot of current or a lot of wind, it's not always fun to be trying to hold one place in a somewhat narrow waterway while you're waiting for that bridge to open. Uh, so that's just something to consider when you're planning where you're going each day. Okay, um, I think we've covered a, a good bit of information and you've alluded to and referenced the greatloop.org website in the segments area, but what are some other things, some other resources besides the ones you've already mentioned that are available in that section? Yeah, the segments area really um, has a lot of information and I think it's one of the little known features on the greatloop.org website. So again, it's the Great Loop route menu. One of the options on that menu is for the Great Loop segments. Once you're in that area, each segment of the Great Loop is listed on the page. When you click on one, you get these special considerations we've just talked about, but you also have additional links that will lead you to a sample itinerary for that segment. So it breaks that segment into individual legs that you may cruise on one day, one particular cruising day. It's just one example of probably an infinite number of combinations you can put together for a Great Loop itinerary, but it just kind of gives you an example of some of the possibilities. Each leg or each day's cruise also has a GPX file you can download for planning purposes uh, that you can load into your own navigation software to kind of see where this portion of the route goes. And each one has what, what we call a flyover video. Um, these are the tracks from the perch and we've superimposed them on Google Earth and added the motion so you can actually kind of see where the perch, our boat, went on each leg of the Great Loop. 
Um, so there'll be some new ones of those coming out shortly. Because again, we we were missing the gap from um, Panama City Beach to Fort Myers, um, and we're filling in that gap starting yesterday. So we'll have more of those videos coming out really shortly, and we'll be finishing up those flyovers um, and the GPX files that are missing from that. There's also some family resources in those segments, um, links to harbor guides for each segment. So if you're on the Gulf Coast of Florida and you're looking for information about, for example, Fort Myers, if one of our harbor hosts has written a harbor guide about Fort Myers, there's a link right in the section to um, all of the harbor guides for that segment. Um, so it's really kind of a one-stop shop for all of the AGLCA resources about the segment you're planning or currently cruising. Uh, I believe there's a link to the podcasts for that segment as well. So it's really kind of the catch-all spot for the segment information. And I yeah, it's definitely a great resource for current members and it uh, would be a good resource for prospective members too. So hopefully that'll entice them to join once they've heard this information on this podcast today. Exactly. And I, I think we've pretty well covered it. Um, I will keep you updated on my whereabouts. <laughs> <laughs> um, like I said, by the time this airs, um, I expect to be in clear water. Um, and then shortly thereafter, moving further south, looking for some warming, warmer weather. So um, thank you, Karen, for helping me get these details out to everyone. And thank you for all the work you do behind the scenes to help make these resources available on the website, because it is certainly a team effort. Well, you're quite welcome and good luck with your golf crossing. <laughs> Thank you. And thanks to everyone who has watched or listened today. We'll be back next week with another episode of The Great Loop Radio. Until then, safe cruising.